Nigel Dakin was sworn in as governor of Turks and Caicos Islands on July 15, 2019. He leaves the office in a couple of days after serving almost four years in that position. It's a pleasure to have him on Sun TV's program, Face to Face. Welcome, Governor Dayton. When you look through the rearview mirror on Turks and Caicos, what do you see? I like the analogy of a rearview mirror. So I guess at this moment, what looms largest in it were the, uh, the, the really big challenges that we faced during the last four years. So COVID it looms in that mirror, uh, even, even though it's retreated now, rising serious crime and the suppression of it, collapse of Haiti, rising migration, you know, the annual challenge of, of hurricanes. But I suspect what will happen relatively quickly after I've left is if you like those challenges will retreat and different images will come up in that mirror much more positive actually images of um, extraordinary people here extraordinary times here some progress here so I think it's going to change over the next few months what would you say was your mission when you first came to Turks and Caicos Islands and what would you say your governorship what impact would you say your governorship made on the territory what, what, what was your mission when you came? So, so I regularly look back on the inauguration speech that I made, and you covered, I recall, sort of pretty comprehensively. And I think I said in that that I genuinely came with no agenda, and I did not come with an agenda. But I was determined that it was going to be a governorship based on values, and I sort of laid out what those values were, were to listen and to care and to serve and to be clear and to be straight and also to try and preserve what was great and improve where that was possible. And also to have a really strong working relationship with the government of the day. And, and I, I hope those values and ethos and some ways promises I made, I hope that that has stayed consistent throughout the four years. Okay, on July 16th, 2019, shortly after you were sworn in, you wrote on Instagram, and I quote, crucially, a set of values doing what is right rather than what is convenient and being clear about what your immediate priorities are, the context in which they sit. Looking back now, based on those sentiments, how would you define your greatest successes and your worst failures? Yeah. Okay, so I'd start by saying, I think I've said this to others, that you know, failure is an orphan and and success has many fathers. And, and I think it is really clear to say that any success I've had is shared success. It is impossible for the governor to have a success without many being involved, in particular the Premier of the day and the elected government. Um, in terms of successes, uh, I think the first was resetting the relationship between the governor and the government. Uh, I think for the last four years, whichever government's been in power, it's been a collegiate purposeful relationship aimed at delivering what the elected government of the day wished to deliver. And I think almost every other success sort of sits below that in a way because it's, for me, it's the precursor of all others. Um, there's areas around national security, I think, that I'll leave. There's a, a, a national security strategy, a national security permanent secretary and a secretariat, which embeds issues. Uh, there's a regiment that supports those national security goals. Within the police, we've built an intelligence apparatus that wasn't there and was absolutely crucial in the end to suppressing the violence we had last year. Um, we're moving towards a border force. We've put in place uh, what can become a Coast Guard if the, if the government w wills it. Um, we've managed, in terms of how it impacts on us, the collapse of Haiti within that, I think. Um, and, and I guess the success has to be COVID. I mean, I, I, I don't think we could have started with a weaker hand at the beginning of COVID. We had almost no provision on the islands to deal with a pandemic. And we were an economy completely dependent on international travel. And so that looked really bleak in March 2020. Yet we come out of the pandemic, no debt, six months reserves in the bank, vibrant economy. That, that was barely predictable back in 2020. Okay, I get all that. But under your stewardship, the country experienced a record number of sloop arrivals, um, record number of murders last year. 
even though you were not personally responsible for any of those, um, what do you say to those who surmise that nothing changed under your leadership? Okay, so well, let's let's deal with the, the two different the two different issues, but actually they triangulate back to being one issue. So. Uh, why is there a record number of sloop arrivals? Because we've interdicted a record number of sloops. And when I first came here, I went out in my first week with the Maritime Police. And if, we, if you like, we toured the coastline and I kept seeing the discarded hulls of wooden boats on the beaches of the Turks and Caicos Islands. Now the public at that point weren't seeing lots of photographs of Haitian migrants being arrested because they weren't being arrested, they weren't being interdicted, they were landing. So the, the fact there's a record number of boats leaving Haiti is to do with a terrible collapse of governance and a breakdown of law and order in Haiti. The fact we're interdicting them is a, is a very, very significant success. And the other success linked to it is that there's many being turned around that we never see, but through a partnership with the US Coast Guard and a growing partnership with the Bahamas, uh, they don't reach us, they're turned back. And I, I, I learned two weeks ago that the, the US Coast Guard turned around 9,000 migrants before they could reach TCR of the Bahamas last year. So I, I don't see that as a failure at all. I see that as a really significant success, and in particular a success by our maritime police officers who I think are genuinely, if not world-class, regional class. So we, so are we judging, are we judging success based on interception or? Well, how else would we? I mean, uh, can we stop them from coming? Can we, can, you, can we stop the sloops, as the Premier once said? Is, are we, can we stop the sloops while we can? Uh, yeah, so I think she was, in some ways, horribly and perhaps deliberately misunderstood on that. Uh, but the answer is, at the moment, the Turks and Caicos Islands a population of, let's say, 50,000, set against Haiti, a population of 11 million, that's 250 times our size, with a completely non-functioning government. No, the Turks and Caicos Islands cannot, at the moment, influence the number of boats leaving Haiti. It can't, and neither can the United States of America. Uh, neither can all the regional powers prevent that. If they could, I assure you, the United States would be. What we can do is work in really strong partnership with them, that the moment boats start to leave, we've got concentric circles of defense that prevent them landing here. And so, unfortunately, during my period of governorship, yes, you're going to have to judge success by the numbers that were arrested and repatriated, as said against the numbers that got past us. And we, we significantly changed the story on that in terms of percentages. But how do you um, reconcile that with the fact that it, is con it, con it continues to cost the country more? I mean, having to send them back, I mean, it re the record numbers of people, you have to send them back. Well, we do have to send them back. I mean, the alternative to us not sending them back is to allow them to stay here. And I'm talking about the, the fact that we should be turning them around before they get here so that we don't incur the cost of having to send them back. Yes. Yeah, so. So we turned around in partnership with the US, 9,000 last year. 3,000 got past, rows and rows of defense. US Coast Guard cutters, US fixed wing, US rotary wing. By the time they've got past all of that, the first time we're gonna know about them is when they hit our radar. When they hit our radar, we've got that very well sewn together now with our maritime police, and there's an interception. Okay, uh, let's move on from that. Um, would you have liked to stay on a little longer? Um, or did you actually apply to stay on longer? I mean, you're, I think you're the longest serving governor in the Turks and Caicos, if i um Yeah, well, I'm gonna be very sad to leave TCI, but this now brings me to 40 years of service with government and the Crown. And I think after 40 years, it's probably right to move on. The, um, the reason for leaving in March was, uh, was deliberate in this, in, for two reasons. Um, the first was that I arrived during a hurricane season. Within about four to six weeks of arriving, we were faced with a tropical storm building towards us that became Dorian. I didn't want my successor to have to go through that, if you like, immediate baptism of fire, uh, hence leaving in March. Uh, and then the second reason, as it got closer, was how cool I think that it's our deputy governor who will be our acting governor alongside our Premier that's going to be at the coronation. 
I think that's a, that's a, a, a wonderful statement about the Turks and Caicos Islands. And so had I stayed on just a few months, if you like, I'd have had the pleasure of going to the coronation. But I, I'm actually really proud that Anya's going to be there. But I'm asking if you wanted to stay on longer. Did you want to stay on longer? Or you? No, I think, I think I've reached the point where certainly this year, 2023 was, was the year for me to leave. Okay, you're being succeeded in a few weeks by someone who some regard as a rookie diplomat because she's only had uh, two, two years experience in Anguilla. And the, the dynamics in Anguilla are slightly different from Turks and Caicos Islands. Um, one does not expect you to say anything bad about the incoming governor, but realistically speaking, how confident are you that she is up to the task, given what you've seen and what you've left behind? So, uh, I mean, you're right. I'm clearly not going to say anything negative about the incoming governor, but I don't have to, and I am going to say a whole bunch of really positive things about the incoming governor. I mean, I know that a whole number of different people were interviewed for this role. Significant number of people were interviewed. And in the end, there was a decision that because this is considered a tough governor's role, that the, the best thing for the Turks and Caicos Islands was to take somebody that already had experience of the Caribbean, already had experience of governing, to come here. And I mean, frankly, I wish I'd had her experience of governing a different territory before I arrived in the TCI. But then how can you say that um, experience in the Caribbean it would, would suffice when, in fact, uh, one would argue, or one can argue that, given what we're experiencing now, given your background in national security, mm. that the, your successor should have been someone who has that kind of experience or even more experience, given what we're facing now? Mm. Um, well, she, well, she hasn't, but what she has got is she's got a huge experience in the world of justice. And justice is very significantly linked to our national security issues, which we, I guess we might come on to at some point. Uh, she's also, if you take a look at um, the future governor's CV, she's been involved in some enormous initiatives that have involved, if you like, project management. And in some ways, I think you've got us in the right order, which is, if you like, uh, if you can imagine, if, if I've laid out the architecture of how this needs to be delivered, I think she's going to come in and build what needs to be delivered on top of it. I mean, she was with us uh, in Miami. That was a really significant moment for her to leave her present job, to come and sort of embed with us as a Turks and Caicos Island delegation amongst the US and the, and the Bahamas. She closed off for us at that um, conference. And she's got it. I mean, she really has got it. And, and in everything that she was saying to us, you could see her really anxious to get here and, and get to work. Some observers believe that UK governors are sent and selected for a specific purpose, role and function. Yes. Um, given your knowledge of how and why they're chosen, what, what would you tell us is her role and function? Um, yeah, so I first of all think the premise in some ways is wrong. Um, I mean, I can tell you that in terms of the, what briefing I had before I came out here, national security wasn't top of the list of that at all. It was not? It was not. Um, what was the top of the list? Um, well, I was thinking back, actually, as to, to what that was. And I think it was essentially that it was, it was really clear that the Turks and Caicos Islands were on a great, a great trajectory out of a difficult period. And it, it was sort of steady as, steady as you go, in a way. Um, because at any one time, and we're all like this, you've only got so much bandwidth to deal with. And, and an organisation like the Overseas Territories Directorate is such an organisation. There are many more pressing issues in London about the Overseas Territories, if you like, than Turks and Caicos Islands. And, you know, that would include you know, Argentinian aggression towards the Falklands or you know, the collapse, if you like, of governance in BVI or real pressures going on in the British Indian Overseas Territory. So, so it, it, I think the view as I was coming out here was, and I subscribe to it, by the way, that the TCI is on a good trajectory. Let's just keep that story going. So what's her mission, do you think? What, what, did you ha what file did you hand over to her to say, well, she has to continue along this vein? Yeah, so I think, I think the, um, the thing that did change during this period was it is impossible to now not recognise that the territory is under extraordinary national security and internal security pressures. And I think what's probably, and, I, and what I certainly know in the UK, is now up at ministerial level that's recognised. I mean, 
10 days ago, I was on a video conference call with the, the Foreign Office Minister for the Overseas Territories, the Minister for the Armed Forces, and the Minister for Security in the Home Office. Very, very unusual for a governor to be speaking to three ministers all at once about that issue. So, the, uh, <clears throat> and that means that number 10's aware, and because we had the royal visit, the palace is aware. The fact that TCI, TCI is under immense pressure is really well understood now. Yeah. Speaking of the royal visit, how much did that cost the country, the royal visit? And was it really, did it serve any purpose, uh, the royal visit? And what was the cost to the taxpayers? I, I can't tell you what the cost was. Um, genuinely, because I don't know what the cost was. Um, what I'd say the benefit was, was I think anybody that engaged with the, the royal couple would be able to in some ways answer that better than I can. But what it allowed us to do was showcase the very best, I think, of the Turks and Caicos Islands. And if you look at it, it had a really strong emphasis on youth and the future. Um, it's a very long time since we've had a royal visit here. If we are a British overseas territory, and we are, and if I do represent the royal family here, which I do, I think it's entirely appropriate that they visit, and they visit in the way that they did. But is the monarchy relevant to us still in this modern era? And are governors really necessary, do you think? Uh, well, there's an, answer to, there's an answer to that, isn't there? And the answer to that is there will become a moment when that question is asked, and that's the question of independence. Yeah, we will get there eventually, but... Uh, I, I mean, that's... It, it's, it, I don't think it's... Um, but when we get there, the, the, I guess the, the, the point is that that is... In, entirely in the power of the people of the Turks and Caicos Islands to decide that very question. Let me ask you this. Are you aware of any incidents of corruption in either of the two governments um, since you were here? Uh, if you're talking at the ministerial level, absolutely not. Okay. So we can't, we don't, we, um, there's some people who believe that this lady has is coming to perhaps clean up um, after you've left, given her legal background and so forth? Um, if that is her brief, and I w wouldn't have seen her brief, uh, that isn't in it, I wouldn't have contributed to it. And I would say that the... Um, I mean, I've been very public on this, uh, including a post I made yesterday, that I think, again, I said in, in that inauguration speech that I thought most Caribbean countries, in fact, most countries, would be blessed to have two leaders one as Premier and one as the leader of the opposition, of the calibre of, of the then Premier, Charlene Cartwright-Robinson, and the then leader of the opposition, uh, Washington Charles Missick. And everything that I've experienced over the last four years has reinforced that. OK, speaking of uh, corruption, are you satisfied that we have the institutional capacity now to deal with corruption in government in Turks and Caicos Islands? Uh, I would like to see an enlarged integrity commission. I think the, again, organisations only have so much bandwidth. I, th I think there are other ways, though, that we can tackle corruption, and I think most of those now are on track. And the biggest way we're going to do that, and I'm so delighted that the present government's got this as one of their top ten priorities, is, is e-government. And when you look at where corruption now occurs, if I was to choose one word that, that generates corruption in TCI, it's the word delay. The minute there's delay in an important process, it sort of opens the gate, if you like, for somebody to believe that they, sh they could ask for money or should pay money for some sort of fast track process. And we need to do everything we can in government to remove delay in vital process. The fastest way to do that is e-government. E-government then also provides intense transparency of process. Supervisors can track issues through. So, so if I was to make one investment to reduce the chances of corruption, it would be government. I don't need to because the present government's so focused on delivering it. You're talking about um, in, 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 enlarging the entire commission, but successive governments have said that it is the very commission that has been responsible for so-called tying their hands and not being able to execute things on behalf of the people. How do you see that um, being an impediment to good governance? I think, they'd, I think rather than say that, they'd have to lay out detailed examples that demonstrated that, <coughs> uh, because I haven't seen any. But they both said that. If, uh, the PDM has said that, and so has the PNP. That well, I think they, the Interior Commission has prevented them from, you know, fleshing out their manifestos because it, it ties their hands. Um, so. Well, I think you need to ask both the PDM and the PNP to not just say that, but to give examples to you of where that's the case. 
91.1 Sun FM, Turks and Caicos' best mix of R&B and classic hits. Sun FM, Turks and Caicos' best mix of R&B and classic hits. Okay, you have, you've worked, as you said, you've worked with two premieres. Um, first, Honorable Charlene Carter at Robinson, and secondly, now um, uh, Premier Washington Mystic. Yeah. Both have different personalities. Um, how do you compare their, their leadership styles? Uh? Um, so, yes, different. There's, there's more, actually, that in some ways is similar about them than different, I'd reflect, which is, uh, the first is they are both phenomenally hardworking, extraordinarily hardworking. I mean, I've often made up in my life, um, when I've been in the room with far smarter people than me, by outworking them. Generally, I've found over 40 years I can outwork most people in a room. They can both outwork me. I mean, they are, they are, they have been phenomenal servants of the people in that regard during both premierships, both in different ways. And I'd also observe that I, th I never have seen a moment or saw a moment when I didn't think they were making the decisions they were making genuinely in the interests, the immediate interests and the long-term interests of the Turks and Caicos Islands. And then I think finally the, um, the thing that binds them rather than divides them is I think they both understood instinctively as politicians that the way to drive forward an, an agenda was to work with the governor rather than against the governor. And since I had the same view as well about my relationship with the Premier, it worked really well. Which one do you prefer, Washi or Charlene? Oh, that's an impossible... I'm asking you the same it, it, But it is impossible. <laughs> it is impossible because I admire both of them very much. And I think in some ways both were well suited for their moments. I mean, any, gov any government anywhere in the world, and I'm now talking about the PDM government that had to tackle the consequences of two Category 5 hurricanes and a pandemic on their watch in the space of one electoral term. I mean, that is an extraordinary demand on government. I mean, government is hard when you're just delivering, if you like, business as usual, but, but to, to do it between, between and amongst three devastating events, I think is extraordinary. I ask you that question because during the PDM government, you were a little more outspoken, more visible. Um, but it, one, one got the sense that when the PMP came in, you were a little more withdrawn and laid back and not as vocal. Um, so I got the sense that you had a better working relationship with um, one of the Charlene um, characters. Uh, I, okay, I can see why you might draw that conclusion. I think the truth is um, that where I, feel, where I felt I had to take a, a very visible, a very front and center role was in the, the early stages of the pandemic. And, and not least because there was a period then that I had emergency pass. And so it was essential, I think, in, in you know, just a set of extraordinary circumstances where there's people are locked down, there's curfew, there's immense uncertainty, that I think the government had to be visible at that point. So it was, I think, linked to events rather than political colours, if you like. Okay, people's words and actions should not be held against them for eternity. But I want to take you back to when you first came, there was a famous picture of you in Dukyard, sitting yes. among the Haitians and with a little boy and so on. And that has led some people to believe that you're pro-Haitian and that you are uh, more interested in perhaps in the, the Haitians getting more um, autonomy and having a larger presence here. How would you respond to those criticisms that you are pro-Haitian and that you would like to see Haitians having a greater influence in Turks and Caicos Islands? Yeah, so, well, let's deal with, if you like, that first week and, and that photograph. 
uh, and I don't mind that photograph being held against me for the rest of my life in a way and in some ways the wonderful thing about that Instagram post now is that people can look back retrospectively and without me adjusting anything of, of, of my history if you like read what was in my mind or what I was doing at any given point it was it was almost as though I've published my diary contemporaneously as I went on so, so, so there can be no revision of motives you know with the benefit of hindsight so if you look what I wrote on that particular day I went to Dockyard because it is in my nature that if there is a problem you go to it you do not sit in your office and have people come and describe it to you and it was it was incredibly clear to me from before I arrived here and I'd visited the islands before I arrived as a as a tourist and I'd read a lot that if you like I could encapsulate the the problems that I was going to have to deal with while I was here in dockyard and being out with the maritime police you know if, if there's two images you want to take from that first week that those are them so absolutely no regrets going to dockyard I've been back to dockyard regularly since I'm really pleased now uh, that there's a commission being set up under uh, uh, Judge Carla Simons to start to tackle the issues of Dockyard. We've got somewhere between five and 7,000 people living on 21 acres. That's a favela-style shantytown. Where's the hardest place for the police to police, if you like? And, and how did we suppress the violence? We suppressed the violence by being able to get into Dockyard and tackle the criminals that were lodged in Dockyard. So those are the reasons for going to Dockyard. Um, it, in, and, and what I think is interesting about this point about Haitians or not, I think what that picture actually did was hold a mirror up to other people to see a reflection of themselves in it. But how do you address the perception that you're pro-Haitian and that you are all for Haitians getting more autonomy and so on? Um, well, the, the, I mean, the first thing I'm going to say is that I'm not anti-Haitian. But I'm the governor of the Turks and Caicos Islands. I'm not the governor of just the Turks and Caicos Islanders. Okay, so all people that are resident in these islands sit and rest under the constitution and the constitution is the thing that guides me. So I think we'd be in a very, very dangerous place if in some ways the, the governor didn't go to Dot Yard or the governor didn't engage with the Haitian community. Engaging with the Haitian community was fundamental during the pandemic. I mean, myself and Dr. Denise Braithwaite spent, and the deputy governor spent extraordinary long periods of time with the Haitian pastors helping educate them. You know, we broadcast on Haitian radio. You can't ignore this community. This community is a real thing. You also got some pushback when you elected, when you selected, sorry, uh, a Haitian to be your appointed member and the Dominican Republic, um, who's also a national. You have any regrets about those two things? No, I think um, particularly uh, important appointments. Uh, and, and, and I mean, the first thing to clarify, and I understand why you say it, but I appointed two Turks and Caicos Islanders, one with Haitian ethnicity and one with Dominican ethnicity, but I did appoint two Turks and Caicos Islanders. And the, I did that because the constitution helps guide my appointment and the way the constitution guides my appointment is to place people into the House of Assembly that could not normally get there and express a view. And, and I do think in terms of building a nation here, it's incredibly important to take a conversation and the, these conversations are happening every day and they're essential conversations to have, whether it's in your, in your home or in a bar, restaurant, in the street, the place for that conversation about what the nation's gonna be in the future has to take place on the floor of the House of Assembly. And how could it not take place, if you like, if there isn't a voice that can talk to the Haitian community and the Dominican community and other communities? Okay, let's, de let's develop this topic some more. Um, last week, uh, we carried a story in the Sun saying there are 9,000 um, voters on the voters list and a population of 45,000. And there has been some debate about whether the franchise should be enlarged in those circumstances. What's your view on the enlarging of the franchise? So it's a, um, it's again, it's, a, it's an issue that's on everybody's lips at the moment. My suggestion would be just put a pin in that issue about the franchise and put it to one side for a moment. I think there's a much healthier, more interesting conversation to have first. 
And when we have that conversation, the answer to the second point flows. And that big conversation is what is, what is the Turks and Caicos Islands nation? And what is its purpose in 2023? But looking forward to, if you like, 2040, there was a 2040 vision statement and beyond that, because the, the difference between this territory and many countries and territories is this territory is growing at 4% per year compounded. Okay? So my predecessors in 1980, when they governed the Turks and Caicos Islands, there were 7,000 people in the Turks and Caicos Islands. In the next decade, we're going to get to 70,000 people, a 10 times growth in population in less than a lifetime. I mean, where I've got massive empathy with the Turks and Caicos Islanders is that is a completely discombobulating idea, a 10 times growth in population in less than your life, lifetime. But the, what the nation looks like when the population grows like that and how you position the Turks and Caicos Islands to be as successful as it needs to be has to sit around this conversation, what is the nation and what is its purpose? Once you've decided that, I think questions about who belongs to that nation, who has the franchise for that nation, starts to flow easily from it. But then how do you then respond to those who fear being a minority in their own country? Yeah, so I get, I mean, um, what I don't want to do is in, in any sense diminish that fear. That's a very legitimate fear and it's one that's felt I mean, it's one that sits very comfortably with a, a global trend at the moment that does sit around identity politics. And it doesn't matter where you look. You can look at the United States, you can look at the United Kingdom, you can look at in, within the United Kingdom, within our relationships within the United Kingdom, relationship with Europe, you can look further afield than that. People are, at the moment, increasingly identifying, if you like, with the smallest identity that they feel comfortable with. And why is that? It's, it's a very natural human reaction to change and dramatic change. And people here can see that change. It, it, it's, it's human and it's, uh, it's understandable. The, the question then is, is how, how are your interests then best served if you take a 20 year view on this? And it's not for me to answer that question. Okay, I get that, but, but, but let me ask you directly then. Mm. Do you think that there should be more voters on the voters list? A uh, population of 45,000, voters list 9,000, given what happens in other parts of the Caribbean and the world. Do you think that the percentage of those who are on the voters list compared to the population size is too small? Um, I'm going to answer your question, but I'm going to lead into it because there's some, f there's, there's some facts, I think, that are important to to work through to get to the answer. So it's not so much the fact that there are 9,000 on the voters list and there's 45 to 50,000 people living in the islands because a very significant proportion of those are on work permits. And I think we've got to be very clear that the purpose of a work permit is to come here to aid our economy and then to leave, okay? now. That hasn't been policed properly over decades. So you do end up with, if you like, accidental citizenship. But just for the moment, I want to take out of this conversation people that are on work permits. So then that leaves with those that are left, if you like. There's 9,000 uh, Turks and Caicos Islanders. We know from the stimulus package that was rolled out this year that there's something a little over 5,000 BOTCs adult BOTCs. And that doesn't then include those who are here for permanent residence. But in other words, this community are people that are going to spend the rest of their lives here. And their children are going to spend the rest of their lives and their grandchildren and so on. So this is, this is a multi-generational issue. I sign all the documents that the immigration ministry, if you like, the home ministry produce and I can see what is happening. And so, for example, in 2021, something like 1,300 people had the opportunity, were given the opportunity to stay here for the rest of their life, either PRC or BOTC. In that year, about 50 people became Turks and Caicos Islanders through marriage or descent. It was a similar story, although slightly smaller numbers in 2022. And the theme continues. In other words, in the last 26 months, of all the people that have the right to stay here for the rest of their lives, only 
became Turks and Caicos Islanders, and that includes all the people that were agreed by the Islander Commission. Most of those documents that I sign are of children, they're not of adults. And so what is building up, if you like, behind this story is a very significant number of people that will, that will be here forever, as will their children. And then people need to ask, then people need to ask the question that I came to earlier, what's the nation? What's the purpose of the nation? If in the future we were to be independent, how do we decide how we're going to be independent? Who has a say in that? And if they have a say in it, how do we want them to support the nation in the future? Once that conversation's happened, people will start to work out what the voter list should look like. I'd only, and I promise to answer your question, I'd only say at the end of it that, that those that wish to stick absolutely to the status quo, given the facts that I've just given you, need to point examples, democratic examples, where that smaller number of people with the vote have been able over a long period of time to, if you like, convince everybody that didn't have the vote to follow the laws that are being set by them. So let me ask you directly, do you think that those people who you said are, are now entitled to live here for the rest of their life, should they be allowed to vote, and in your opinion? So why I'm not going to answer that question is that I honestly believe, and I think my actions have shown this, it's not just my words with you today, this is this is the fundamental question that has to be answered. I'm, I'm asking your opinion, though. I mean, there's nothing wrong with you answering. I mean, um, if I'd wanted to and express an opinion, I could have done that through, if you like, appointing the chair of the commission that looked at this. And I actively chose to, if you like, give the premier and the leader of the opposition the choice of that. And it's, I'm not dodging it, Hayden. What I'm saying is, I think something rather more profound than that. It is for the Turks and Caicos Islanders alone to work out the answer to this incredibly difficult problem. And I don't dismiss how difficult it is. Okay, I get it. You know, given what you've just said about um, enlarging the franchise, do you think the Turks and Caicos is ready for independence at this point? Um. Um, so, so again, the, the only people that can and should answer that are the people of the Turks and Caicos. Now I'm asking if you think they're ready. So again, why I'm not going to answer that directly and there is a good reason for it. Well, you can answer directly because, I mean, you're outgoing governor, I mean, but is that your opinion on, on matters? You're not influencing decisions on behalf of any government, or the UK government for that matter. So why, why I don't think it's appropriate to answer that is let us just say now, right, and I'm, I'm trying to help educate, if you like, the audience in a way on this one, is that let's say right now there was a, a, a campaign for independence. And if I was the governor of the day, I would remain entirely silent on it. It is not for the governor in any sense to influence that debate. So people should not expect in any future debate, whenever that may be, for if you like the governor to be, to be making the case for the Turks and Caicos Islands to remain British. If there is a case to be made for that, it's Turks and Caicos Islanders that are going to need to make that case. But one of, one, of, one of the things that drives that debate about going independence is because you don't get any help from the UK. Mm -hmm. And in, in many cases, the, the response to the UK has been very tardy. In October last year, for example, there was a report in the London Guardian in which you were quoted as saying you were unhappy with how they respond to uh, Turks and Caicos when they needed help. So I think one of the things that drives that, that debate uh, that, um, towards the call for independence is because you don't get any funds from the UK and you don't get any help. Um, do you think that the UK is living up to its responsibility in terms of helping Turks and Caicos Islands? Okay, so let's, let's just start with, if you like, financial support from the UK. So I think one of the um, a golden thread, I think, that connects both the PDM and the BNP, it's a very honourable position both have taken, is they've worked unbelievably hard to generate, if you like, financial independence from the UK. And that is incredibly important, I think, in terms of um, you know, the freedom of decision making. Uh, now, in terms of what support has come into the islands from the UK, I mean, if, if we just use the period I've been governor, and it is easy to forget some of this, and often a lot of it is unseen. But recall, before the pandemic, we brought, I think, around 18 armed police officers over to support our tactical unit. At the start of the pandemic, we were the only overseas territory to get this. 
we brought in uh, a security force to help reinforce our maritime police because we were extremely nervous, if you like, of Haitian sloops landing with COVID. And so that was to reinforce our borders. But they also brought a whole host of sort of medical and logistical support with them. Um, we flew in consumables, we flew in ventilators, we helped build the National Laboratory, um, which allowed us to test for COVID for the first time. Uh, then, of course, there were the vaccines. You know, we were getting the vaccines at exactly the same pace that those in the UK were, and way before the rest of the Caribbean. And in fact, that was a really important part of the offer that we could make in terms of stimulating our economy. Yeah, but yeah, but, but those are kind of basic things. But when you needed them most, um, when 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 there was the dire need, they were tardy, and the, hence you kept some noise. So. Yeah. So let, uh, let's but let's just finish some of that narrative because you know at times of hurricane, I mean the day after Fiona went past us, uh, HMS Medway was was off our coast and and so on. So, um, helicopters have been based here. Now in terms of the immediacy of the ask you're right in September October I mean the, the the challenge we faced then was that we needed a dramatic amount of varied types of support coming at us within days and what I got from the UK was what I needed from the UK what I needed from the UK was a group of really talented detectives that could sit if you like at the center of of the police force to build for the first time a gang and gun and drugs team to properly go after the gangs that we knew now had emerged. Yes, but what has happened is that we've had UK police um, several times in the past and we've only gotten results really and truly when the Bahamians came. Uh, so people have, uh, have espoused the view that the UK yeah. police are not as effective at governing, at policing Turks and Caicos Islands yeah. as our regional uh, well, colleagues, yeah. I mean, in, in, there's truth in this, actually, and there's, the, and there's non-truth in this. So where, where's the truth? I, uh, from my experience here now, and having watched what played out during that period, unquestionably, it is far better, in my view, for us to have uniform armed police from the Bahamas working in lockstep with our tactical unit going into Dockyard. I th that, that was an absolutely seamless... Uh, operation. They they thought the same, they trained together in the past, they worked in a similar way, they were culturally very sensitive to what was happening. I think frankly it worked much better having Bahamas officers in dockyard than say UK police officers. And you're right, they um, in, a, in a confrontation where he drew a weapon, uh, one of the main leaders of the gangs, Brandon Ramming, was shot dead. And that definitely, unquestionably removed pressure that was there. But on the other side of it, the other gang leader that has been arrested has been arrested due to a similar level of collaboration and cooperation between Turks and Caicos Islands detectives and UK detectives here. So in some ways honours are, are equally shared on this. It's just one is much more visible to the public than if you like the other and both are needed. But do you think that if the Bahamians no longer, if, it, if they go and the UK personnel stay, it will lead to similar success or no? G uh, given the history of the UK being here and no evidence of success, UK police? Well, I think there is very strong evidence that the capability now that we've built in the police, and you know, we, we've got such a strong relationship now with the Bahamas that I'm, I'm very confident that if and when we ever have to ask the Bahamas at any point in the future, the Bahamas will be ready. I mean, the, the, the hardest thing in some ways was to work through what's the, what are the legal agreements that is going to do that. We did that in four days. So I'm very confident the Bahamas would be back and looking uh, after our backs if we asked for it. But those UK detectives are here for, I think, from memory, at least three years. And that is going to have a really serious dent. And the key thing that the UK is helping on but is not seen but is incredibly important is the, is the building of a, of a proper intelligence operation for the police. So, you know, one of the things that I'm proud of as I leave is that we've now got lawful intercept on uh, capability for the island. Really proud of the government that took that legislation through the house, world-class legislation. 
we've got the technical capability, we've got the technical capability because the UK helped us. And we've also got a really well-trained, uh, if you like, confidential informant operation now, built and supported by the UK. These are things the public doesn't see, but the reason why the Bahamas police could get to Brandon Ramming and know where he was at a particular time was not through accident. It was through really good intelligence. Okay, but given all that you just said, do you think it's time to perhaps revisit the leadership of the police force, um, given that we've had a couple of foreign police um, commission, police commissioners and they haven't had that much success in the eyes of the public mm. and in some cases the eyes of the local police. Do you think it is time to revisit the, 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 lead, the forces leadership and perhaps look towards the region to see if we can get more effective policing from the region? So when the present commissioner departs it will be if you like an international competition. So it's not a competition that is directed towards the UK or the Turks and Caicos Islands. It will be an international competition. And I'm sure you're right, there are some extremely talented police officers in the region that could apply and they would have, I suspect, extremely strong CVs to to bring. Um, so it will be the best it will be the best candidate at the time of application. I think though I'll say something else else about the leadership of the police force. I think two things have happened, if you like, in the last four years, and they're linked. I mean, one is the complexity of policing now is of a, of a completely different order yes. than it was. And part of that is, if you like, being generated locally. And it's been generated, when I say locally, I mean within the islands. And part of that is sort of the crystallization of a whole set of sort of societal problems that have been growing over time, coupled with, if you like, these large irregular settlements which are very difficult to police so that's the internal but but also if you look at our region if you step back from it we find ourselves now in a very difficult region i mean it's not as though the bahamas are not suffering themselves from really serious violent crime it, to our north it's not it is the case that jamaica to our west is suffering the same it is true that Haiti has collapsed completely during this period. And it's also true, though I'm not sure how well known it is, that one of the biggest cocaine routes uh, in the Caribbean comes out of the Dominican Republic and heads towards the United States. And when you plot that on a map, and you add to that how long and porous our borders are, it puts the TCI in a very difficult crossroads. And so actually what this, this small force has ended up doing is is policing transnational, international gang crime played out here on the streets of TCI. So why do I say all of that? Because at the same time, and I pay huge credit to the government, the government's invested very, very heavily in the police over the last four years. In other words, the police have got a much more complex situation to deal with and they have many more resources now to use. Bring those two together, I absolutely believe, and I think the, the commissioner will take this through with the support of the government, we will end up with a commissioner and two deputy commissioners. One deputy commissioner focused entirely on operational delivery. When does he leave, by the way, commissioner? When does his contract expire? Um. So, uh, certainly not before uh, the end of this year, uh, but it'll be determined by the new governor. Because if, if I were the new governor coming in, um, in the end of, uh, towards the end of June, I'd want to be very confident that I, I felt comfortable, if you like, before a change of commissioner took place. The, I mean, the commissioner I know, and it's, it's frankly a very easy target for people to criticise the commissioner. What I would say is that I think we've had extraordinary leadership from the commissioner. He's been taking the police through uh, a huge change. He did that during COVID, and COVID frankly took two years, I mean, COVID certainly took two years out of my agenda in a way. So he did it during COVID, and if you want evidence of great leadership, you only need to look at how the Turks and Caicos Islands Police Force responded during that upsurge of violence in September, October. I don't think the, I don't think the criticism is necessarily personal. I think what happens is that if, if the team fails, you go after the coach. And I think that's essentially what has happened. So if you see, if you have a situation where there's an overwhelming increase in, 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 in murders 
35 last year to be precise. No matter who's the commissioner, I think that person will be under scrutiny. But, so um, I don't think it's a personal... No, well, sure they should be under scrutiny and sure the governor should be under scrutiny. But let's just play that back slightly because we've got the benefit of hindsight now. So let's say in September, October, when people were calling for the police commissioner's resignation. Let's say that he walked into me and said, you know what, I don't need this anymore. I'm going, thank you very much, and I'm leaving. And he left that day. Do you think that what would then have played out would have played out? Would we have moved as rapidly as we did to suppress the crime in the way that happened? Or would we be left with a horrible period of, of, of disturbance at the top of the police force, zero leadership, where we searched for a new commissioner who would arrive um, or perhaps be promoted from within, but would arrive and then have to reorientate completely. Do you think the Turks and Caicos Islands would be in a better I don't, I don't see it that way, quite frankly, because I think there's continuity. If he, for example, if suppose he was sick for that period, or if he was off on an operation or something, they have a, the police force has a business continuity plan, so I believe that whoever would have taken over at that time would have probably be succeeded. I don't think it is, it is um, his prescriptive right to be there anyone's prescriptive right to be there. Well, I, I, I'll just put on record, I was extremely pleased he was there. And the fact that, I mean, the, 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 the crystallizing moment of that period was when, you know, three police officers came under sustained high velocity automatic fire from Brendan Ramming's gang. And the way those police responded, with extraordinary bravery, bravery moving towards moving towards the criminal and engaging them, even after one of them had been very, very seriously wounded, returning fire. That, to me, from my background, that is the sign of a, of a force that is being led extremely well. Many, many other forces would have buckled at that point, being the size of the TCI force, and it didn't. And I personally uh, uh, owe a debt of gratitude to the commissioner. And okay, there's some people who say that that's because of the behaviour of the police or not. Anyway, but let's, let's look. At that point, the Bahamian, let's be clear, at that point, the Bahamian police were not in the Turks and Caicos Islands. That, that the Baham Bahamian police had not arrived at that point. That was our own Turks and Caicos Islands police force. Very okay, we're not, we're not here to bash you police, but let, okay, let's, let's move on. Um, you're in a position to observe quite a few things in Turks and Caicos Islands. Um, what is your view of the distribution of wealth in Turks and Caicos Islands? Um, do, you, do you believe that enough is being done to empower locals? Or do you think we are experiencing what we call a tale of two cities where the rich are getting richer and uh, the, the poor and middle class are being left behind? Based, based on what you've seen over the past four years, what's your take? I, I mean, this is, again, uh, a really hot topic. Um, and it must be true. Uh, it must be true. I mean, I hear it too often for it to not. Um, I mean, in many ways, if you, if you could... If you could fire a, uh, a single silver bullet to try to solve the challenges here, I mean, one of them would probably be the, the, the rapid development of a very strong, um, wealthy middle class. I mean, it, much good would fall from that. Now, why, why hasn't that happened? I mean, part of it is just this extraordinarily rapid development that I describe. I mean, it, it's almost the sort of development that you used to see in a, in a, a gold rush boom town. So everything gets distorted early on. I mean, I know both political parties are very focused on this, and both have got, both are, both are much closer to the people than I am, and, and, and much closer to the issues. So in some ways, I don't sort of presume to have answers that they, they don't have, and I don't. But I don't disagree with your premise at, at all. Okay, what, 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 what do you make of the fact that thousands of people, if in the context of what we just discussed, what do you make of the fact that thousands of Turks Islanders are moving to the UK? Yeah, so, and I think, I mean, Aidan, you've been here much longer than me. This is a relatively new phenomenon, is it? This shift, you believe, to, towards the UK? Yes. Mm. So... What does it say to you? Um, yeah, so I think, so as far as I've thought about this, I mean, first of all, it, it's, not, um, uh, it's not odd, in a way, of, of people from the Turks and Caicos Islands emigrating. I mean, there's a long history and story of this, um, particularly in the sort of the 70s and 80s, and many going to the Bahamas, for example, to work and elsewhere. 
But this shift towards the UK is interesting. Why is it? I suspect it's linked to the fact that because we're British overseas territory citizens, you can access very affordable, excellent education in the UK rather than in the United States. So you can go to the, to the best universities there are in the United Kingdom for the cost of going to um, a less good university in the UK. And I think now you can draw on um, student loans that UK students can as well to support you. So that must be part of the draw. But do you think it's an indictment on any government or governments that, I mean, that people are leaving because they believe perhaps they can't get opportunities in the land of their birth? Well, I'm not, I'm not sure it's an indictment on any government because I'm not quite sure how governments can really start to control this in the sense that, um, and you know, I, I have children of that, of the age, if you like, of people that are, are leaving, and I, I can't presume to start to control my children on this, these particular issues. But when, when certainly you and I were young, or certainly when I was young, um, and I was leaving school, there were a very small number of professions that I was going to get engaged in. Uh, I was going to be, you know, a, a lawyer or a doctor or an accountant or a solicitor or some, some form of profession because of the school that I went to. I was actually a real anomaly that I joined the army from my school. There are now jobs whose job titles I couldn't imagine back then. And within the t and, and young people today are better educated than I was in my day and much more ambitious and much more globally connected and much more aware of the wider world than I ever was because of, of the internet. And so there, there are, I think, these impulses that make young people want to explore. So this isn't young people going, leaving the islands, I think. that I may be wrong, but I don't think these are the young people leaving the islands because of economic issues. I think these are young people leaving the islands for experience and educational issues. Now, if that's true, there's an opportunity. I mean, that shouldn't be prevented. In some ways, that should be encouraged because the payback is they come back. If, if, you, bring, if you allow people to experience that in their 20s, they're going to come back in their 30s and be infinitely more productive. They're going to come back with a global network, better education, and so on. So I, think, I don't think governments can stop this. I think what governments have got to try and do is harness this energy and find a way of providing enough opportunity here in the islands for people to return. Okay, let's move on. Okay, you were a very visible governor. Uh, you're on Instagram, you're on yeah. social media, you're very um, extroverted, I would say. Um, how do you see this approach helping in terms of how governors have been viewed in the past and do you think this has helped in any way? Yeah, um, yeah so I, th I think that, that you should only do this if you're a governor, if you're comfortable with doing it. That's the first thing. I think it's got to be authentic to you. Um, for me, I thought it was absolutely essential on a, number of, on, on a number of different levels. I think the first is is that, look, like it or loathe it, the governor plays a really important constitutional role within the, the territory. Now, by the time somebody becomes a minister in your government or the premier or holds a, a senior position, the public have got to know them extremely well. They, they may well have known them as children or as adolescents. They've, they've, they've had to compete for an election. By the time they get into a position of power, they're really well known. A governor steps off the plane. And we touched on this earlier when you were asking me questions about the next governor, as a complete unknown entity. And I think it's really important to open a window on yourself so people can work out who you are. And therefore, they can try and put decisions you're making or things you're saying into a much wider context than just the narrow context. That's the, that's the first reason why I think it was important. The second I touched on earlier, which I think in terms of transparency and accountability, I can't hide anything from my past. You've got a log of over sort of 500 and, I can't remember, we're over 500 posts now, which tells you what I was thinking on any given day and why I did anything I wanted. That I think is useful for the public to be able to see. Um, so I would do that, I would do all of that again. Okay, having gone through a national security challenge, various national security challenges and a global health pandemic, what was the thing that kept you up most at night? Um, uh, well, the, the, there's probably a list. Two, two immediately spring to mind. So the first was when 
it became absolutely crystal clear, if you like, that this was a global pandemic. This was going to impact the Turks and Caicos Islands. And it was that first cabinet meeting, if you like, where we, where we went through in detail the two big issues. What does our health provision look like? And what, what is our economy going to look like? And being frank, you could not have walked away from that meeting really in a more bleak position. You know, we had no consumables, no, uh, no um, ability to produce oxygen. We had no ventilators. We had no high dependency unit. We couldn't test for COVID. We had virtually no consumables. And we had a health system predicated on if you got ill, we were going to send you somewhere else, which was about to collapse. And then on our economy, we're the second economy in the world most dependent on tourism and therefore international travel. And that was about to stop. I mean, how could you paint a bleaker picture than that? That was not a comfortable night's sleep after that, just trying to work through. And I think the, in, in perhaps in a more positive way, there was, there was two or three sleepless nights where we had three cabinet meetings, back to back over three days, 40 hours in total in July. And we were determined when we made the decision, we were never rowing back on it. That's why it was so important. And that was to open the islands to the world. And that was about managing risk, not eliminating risk, and seizing opportunity. And you know, when you take a decision like that, how do you really know? And so, I mean, looking back, with the benefit of hindsight, right decision, very, very difficult decision at the time. Yeah, how, how, do you, how do you wish to be remembered, Governor? Um, when, you, when you leave in a couple of weeks, how do you wish to be remembered? Um, I, th I hope, <laughs> First of all, somebody that kept their word. Um, so, so go back to the beginning of what I, what I said, said I would do. Somebody that, although I never can be a Turks and Caicos Islander, that somebody that became, became bewitched by these islands and became a champion for the Turks and Caicos Islands during my time here, Somebody that perhaps reset the relationship between government and governor. And I think that would probably do. Okay, having said that, what, 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 what do you like or dislike most about Turks and Caicos Islands? What, what do you like most? What do you dislike most? To be honest. Yeah, no, I am. So, um, and again, in some ways I said it from the beginning because I'd visited the people of the Turks and Caicos Islands are particularly special. And trying to articulate why that is, is is interesting, but it's in all of my interactions with them, even with people that have disagreed with me strongly, they've been respectful and it's in some ways charming, but in particular it's this word resilient, extraordinary resilience which I find a, an incredibly attractive character. Um, I mean, I've joked with others. I, I mean, I used to say this regularly, uh, which is the, the thing that, the one thing that I, that you, you took so little actually from the UK. I mean, this feels much more like a North American territory than a UK territory. Um, and you took so much from the US, but you took, you haven't taken the one thing you should have taken. What you talk from the UK, and we're, we're allowed it, we're pessimistic by nature. Americans are incredibly optimistic by nature. And I think the Turks and Caicos Islands have got so much to be optimistic about. I mean, when I get out of bed in the morning, I am truly excited about the future of these islands because I can just see nothing but potential. If we resolve a couple of the issues that we described earlier, particularly that sits around population, if the Turks and Caicos Islands could resolve that, there is absolutely nothing stopping these islands being powerhouse within the Caribbean. And but you haven't answered me though, what, what you dislike most about Turks and Caicos Islands. Oh, um, so you haven't done it. Okay, but uh, I've, I've definitely learned here, never interrupt a Turk and Caicos Islander when they're interrupting you. It's <laughs> a very smart answer. Okay, you're Barbadian also now by virtue of being married to your lovely wife, Amanda. Yeah. What's next for both of you when you leave um, Turks and Caicos? So we fly from here on the 29th and we fly to Barbados. And in our minds, Barbados is our next home for a period of time that we're, we're uncertain of, but you know, stretches ahead of us. 
but we are definitely taking, uh, if you like, a three-month pause, and we're going off to the United States, and we're going to do a road trip that starts on the, the Mexican-Arizona border and drives the full length of America through Canada, through the Yukon, gets to Alaska, and then we're going to drive to the Arctic Ocean and put our feet in the Arctic Ocean and drive back again. So, th and I think at the end of that, that will have been a, a reset, and then we, we start our lives properly in Barbados. You officially retired after that. You don't, you're not going to be in the service anymore, the diplomatic service anymore, are you? So I'm, I'm not using the word retire, uh, but I am leaving government service. I am using the word sort of graduation. So I think, I mean, it's in my nature. I'm going to work till my last day, I think, at something. It's just what that something's going to be that you'll have to watch out for. So are you going to miss Terry Sinkai? Of course, or, yeah. desperately. Yeah. So in a nutshell, though, let's because we're going to wrap up now. How do you summarize in, um, your your stewardship? If you were to summarize your stewardship in Turkey, how, how would you summarize it? Um, um, it? It would be supporting the islands to not only get through COVID, but to come out of COVID stronger than it went into it and to lay the architecture, the national security architecture, the architecture that includes, if you like, uh, a modernized police force and a regiment and other structures and a whole set of international relationships um, that, that strengthens. And back to your point on um, independence, what I would say about my governorship is I've helped, I think, build capacity on the islands that only supports that ambition, it doesn't diminish it. So. The fact that there is now a regiment is important. It's a, it's a matter not just of defense, but of national pride. You know, I appointed the first Turks and Caicos Islander to be a judge. I've, I appointed the first Turks and Caicos Islander to be the chief magistrate. I've, I've looked for ways to build indigenous capability here, which is essential. And I think I've also helped stimulate, although it's not a comfortable conversation, it's a necessary conversation about what the future nation of the Turks and Caicos looks like. You grade yourself. Oh, you asked me this. To grade yourself, yes. Five. Five out of ten? Or five out of five? Always five. Five out of ten. Okay. Governor Dakin, it was certainly a pleasure to have you on Sun TV's Face to Face. All the best to you and your wife for the future.